Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I can see many familiar names. We are here today for this session on museums. I'm Graciela Melitzko Thornton. I lead the Creative Green Consultancy team at Julie's Bicycle. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar on sustainable practice for museums. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Julie's Bicycle, we are a pioneering nonprofit organization mobilizing the arts and culture to take action on the climate and ecological crisis. Founded by the music industry in 2007, we now work across the arts and culture in the UK and internationally, focusing on four themes, justice and fairness, decarbonization, nature, and circularity and the regenerative economy. Though uh, through the Creative Green Program, Julie's Bicycle offers bespoke consultancy to a range of creative and cultural businesses, building tailored programs with clients, with services, including organizational governance, training, environmental action plan, capacity building. And we are doing really quite a lot of very, very interesting um, plans and, and, and activities at the moment. So um, just a few things I wanted to say in terms of housekeeping. Um, there are live captions available, which you can access using the CC button in your Zoom controls. Your videos are switched off and you are mute by default. If you have any questions for our speakers throughout the session, which I hope so, please send them through in the question and answers and we will get towards them at the end of the session. Also, please follow the conversation on social media using the hashtag Creative Green. So this event is being recorded. All of the materials and the recording will be sent around after the session and we will send some interesting links as well. So I am uh, going to provide you just for five minutes before our speakers join, a little bit of insight of our projects as well, because I think it's, it's really good to share the learning. I wanna share my screen since I prepared only a few slides. I only gonna speak for five minutes. And as you can see in the screen, in the slide, this is the framework we work in the Creative Green Consultancy team and in Julie's Bicycle, where we look at the commitment, governance, understanding all the main environmental impacts, uh, improvement, definitely that's essential, really progressing on sustainability and communicating. Um, I invite you also to have a look on the website. We have a museum's environmental framework, and we also put together a bit of a map of all the resources that can be useful uh, for museums and galleries as well. So look for the map, and that will link you to other documents. Um, recently, we've been doing a lot of research in environmental sustainability in the digital age of culture, so opportunities, impacts, and emerging practices. Also, all the issues around the use of pl plastic, uh, looking at culture beyond plastic. Um, we have a new fantastic hub, uh, the Color Green Lab, and uh, where you can find a lot of resources and research on creative climate justice and very good case studies as well. So I warmly invite you to have a look at all those resources. And we are seeing lots of activities and uh, action in the museum and gallery sectors. And we, we are very keen on becoming more synergetic. Um, the National Council have published recently quite a lot of advice also on sustainability. Uh, we were quite involved with this exhibition, Our Time on Earth, that is now being exhibited at the Barbican. We supported the creation of a sustainability manifesto, and we look at all the planning of this exhibition, stage by stage, that gave us a lot of learning about how to come with more sustainable exhibitions. So um, that, uh, the manifesto and all 
the different activities that um, led into this work are also in the Barbican website. We've been quite involved with the Bio 27 also in Slovenia, um, in Ljubljana. Uh, this is a fantastic project and all the learnings of planning this uh, Biennale in a more sustainable way was compiled now in a new resource about sustainability in exhibitions. It's, it's just coming out, so I'm going to share the link of this as well. Um, we, we really like a lot the way that uh, the Biennale in Sydney was working, looking at partnerships for innovation, looking at more sustainable materials that were exhibited also in the, in the Biennale in Sydney, uh, and particularly resolving problems around materials, um, supporting innovation and supporting uh, upscaling innovation. So that's a, that's a very interesting uh, way of looking at, at problematic materials. Uh, we are working with a growing number of artists and, and sculptures on installations, looking at the life cycle of the materials used in, in, in installations. Um, I think this is also a, a quite a promising area of, of work. And this one is not one of our projects, but I really want to encourage you to have a look. It, uh, the exhibition is now closed. The waste exhibition at the Design Museum, it was all very, very systematized, the carbon footprint of, of the exhibition. You can see it in the DC article, a summary, uh, using renewable energy, reuse please, cross laminated timber frames instead of all this traditional aluminum that is many times used in museums, recycled plastic signage, wall made of and fire bricks that then can be reused again. That's very interesting. Borrow materials for exhibition that then they go back to the manufacturer. So that's, that's really a fantastic idea. We work with that in the Slovenia Biennale, all those log uh, fire, fire logs that you could see there were, are gonna be returned uh, to, to, the, to the sellers of, of uh, fire logs. And, and fundamentally, it's, a, it's also about challenging the usual ways of, of doing thing, things, no? So how, how can we do better? What can do we do differently? Um, I'm going to stop share here and introduce you to our great panelists that we have here today. Um, so I'm going to introduce you to Zoe Luisos in, in the first place. Uh, Alison is a, sorry, <laughs> no, Alison, Zoe. Zoe has been working in the exhibitions departments of the Victoria and Albert Museum for over 12 years, over which time she has overseen the delivery of the v &A, temporary and touring exhibitions including Tudors, Stewards, and the Russian Tsars, a horse, photographer of a style, Mary Quant, and most recently, Epic Iran. Zoe has also been a sustainability champion, and during her time as the VNA sustainability coordinator, she developed and implemented a range of green initiatives across the museum, and particularly in relation to creative recycling and community outreach projects. So let's hand over to Zoe now. And um, I stop sharing. Hi, everyone. Can you see my sharing slides there? They're showing. Great. Well, hi, yes. everyone. <laughs> nice to be here today. Um, thanks for the introduction, Graciela. As she says, I've been at the BNA in the Exhibitions Department for about 12 years now. Um, but something that um, I was also involved in a couple of years ago was a temporary uh, secondment to sustainability coordinator, which was a new role that the museum created at the time so that we could begin to implement um, more uh, uh, integrated approaches to sustainability across the organization. So I'm just going to take you through some of the things that we that we managed to do um, at that time and where we are now. Um, in 2019, we were making good progress as a museum 
in terms of sustainability with regulating our energy systems and moving towards you know better heating and led lighting but um, in other areas kind of softer areas such as recycling single-use plastics anything around staff engagement or um, our public programming and our production methods within our exhibitions had a bit of less awareness around them and this was coinciding with the museum producing a series of exhibitions that were exploring environmental themes so we had fashion from nature we had our food exhibition our cars exhibition so it's becoming increasingly evident of how important it was to enshrine our values further in the production and operation and outreach and not just in the subject matter of our programming and so when I had this opportunity it was two days a week for about five months these are the areas that I was looking to make some progress in and one of the key areas uh, that remains in producing exhibitions is the waste that is created in the process of building and touring them. And it's something that, of course, is inherent to the creative practice across the arts and culture sector and something that the wider community is always grappling with and looking for ways to improve. Um, I'd always been quite obsessed with the things that we throw away uh, with an awareness that these items still had a lot of value to the creative communities that I'm part of and that I'm aware of. Um, we could really benefit from these and it was something uh, I thought was a little bit wrong that we were throwing things away without much of a, um, a thought to a potential second life. So the first thing that we tried to do is to be a bit more strategic about um, redirecting our surplus materials, specifically those. There we go. Um, uh, yeah, specifically to those communities that might not normally have access to them. So this is schools, community groups and young artists. And I'll just take you very quickly through just a couple of samples of the things that we donated at the time. There were a lot more, but um, obviously we're short of time. So from our Fashion from Nature exhibition, we had a number of terrariums, which we donated to local schools. Um, we had some tables that were made of recycled hemp in the exhibition that we got to um, the UK's only organic hemp farm cooperative. Um, we also took a lot of textile scraps. Uh, that our conservation team were struggling to recycle and we donated those to a women's asylum seekers group in Hackney. Um, we had a number of uh, so six and a half thousand surplus Frida Kahlo uh, postcards and we got them to the uh, Indo-American Latin American community in London for some uh, art projects with young people. Um, this is one of my favorite from the food exhibition. We had these large light up signs for the areas of the exhibition on eating and composting. Um, and they went to some friends of mine actually that run a compost club and a permaculture farm in Brighton. And they obviously never thought they'd see the words compost up in lights. So this was really exciting for them to take. And they now use these for their HQ and their workshops that they run in Sussex. Um, and a big thing for me, um, I started my career in community heritage. So something that I was quite invested in was trying to get these materials to smaller, more regional museums um, that you know often don't have access to these types of materials at all um, because of the nature of, of the budgets of working in smaller places. And whilst a very well-funded uh, national organizations such as the BNA, we have you know much healthier budgets to be able to invest in quality showcases, set works, frames, uh, and graphics, uh, which had a single life at that time. So again, it felt a little bit wrong um, to be disposing of them when they were of such potential value to smaller organizations who often have very strong messages to convey um, and yet aren't able to do so as visually impactfully. So this is a museum of ordinary people. Um, there's some contacts of mine who started this kind of emergent museum about um, uh, presenting or, or ordinary people's memories and lives. And we donated this modular warning system that you see that we were disposing of and a range of perspex books, cradles and plinths, which enabled them to really scale up. This is their first pop-up display. Um, and they subsequently won the Brighton Fringe Visual Art Award, something that I know they were um, very grateful for and um, felt that the kind of uh, facilitation of, of additional display materials really helped for them to look um, present their their content a little bit more professionally and gave a due sense of value to the objects that were on display. And then another key um, uh, contact that we have is the Museum of Homelessness, um, again, an emergent activist museum, um, which are calling for radical societal change. When we had our revolution show, which was looking at the period of revolution in the late 60s and early 70s in visual culture, we had a lot of incredible things made for that. You can see here sort of apocalyptic oil drums and television sets, again, all of which wouldn't have a, had a second life at the time, um, but were taken from by the Museum of Homelessness, and they now use these in their live 
interpretation events, uh, which really brings a lot more visual professionalism to their incredible projects. Um, again, they never thought they'd have a five foot giant power fist, uh, something they wouldn't be able to invest in themselves, but they're still using this today um, for their um, uh, interpretation and outreach um, and street work. Um, and it's really given them a lot of confidence that they could have a bit more visual impact with their, um, with their projects. Um, so whilst these donations were really great, it still felt a little bit ad hoc um, and under the radar. Um, these were things that I was sort of facilitating on the side, using personal contacts, and it wasn't really something that the museum were aware of or, or promoting it or telling a story, and it wasn't really being amplified or joined up with the museum's wider work at the time. But they did help me consolidate the idea that we should be striving for a more holistic and circular approach to the way that we build our exhibitions and that as a museum of art and design it's our mission to be creative and lead new and innovative ways to do things and also to support and inspire the wider creative community in the process um, so another main issue that i've been seeing in my role in exhibitions was the disposal of exhibition crates which we do so in high volumes each year so I decided to focus on these as a bit of a case study for piloting uh, a larger project. I came across uh, in the press um, an article uh, concerning 999 Club, um, which is a uh, shelter in Deptford, who devised and built some innovative sleeping pods um, to provide additional emergency shelter. Um, I called them up and spoke to the director to see if maybe we could donate our wood to that cause and ended up having a conversation with the director about much greater need for the provision of furniture for their clients when they move into their first homes and out of the shelter. Um, so we discussed this and we thought it would be a lovely idea if we could build an upcycling outreach project together um, that put the needs of the clients at the heart um, uh, of the creative process. And we thought ideally we would partner clients from the shelter with woodwork mentors and using our surplus crates uh, from the museum, they would design and co-build a piece of furniture for them to take to their first homes. And we were very excited about this project, but again, at that point, we had no money, we had no workshop, we had no tools, we had no clients signed up, we had no mentors. It was really very much a pie in the sky idea, but something that really captured both of our hearts and we wanted to try and make it work. So I took this idea to our festivals team, who luckily were very behind it, and they saw an opportunity to link it with the 2019 London Design Festival that year, uh, which was on design solutions to the climate crisis. They also presented it to the director, who again was luckily very in support of it, but wanted it to scale up and become a bigger and more impactful event. Um, because at that time we were hosting the Food Waste Summit, we were doing some quite high profile events around hosting conversations around sustainability. So this was an opportunity um, that needed to be amplified. Um, yeah, so it was a great idea, to, um, opportunity to sort of link this sort of fledgling furniture project to the wider initiatives of the museum. Um, so we had it approved and we had eight weeks to work very quickly. Um, the 999 Club being in Lewisham, um, they contacted Lewisham College, explained the situation and very gratefully they uh, offered up their workshop for us to use. I rang around uh, furiously to tool suppliers and paint suppliers and luckily again everyone was very much behind the project. Oops, sorry, I don't know what's happened there. Right, sorry, I might have to reshare that. Sorry, it's just happened. Can everyone still see? I don't know what's there. Okay. Can everyone see that? Kind of lost. We could we could still see it, and not now. Now is you. Is it yeah, back now? That's in, yes, that's good. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That's good. Um, uh, yes, we managed to get um, tools donated, paint donated, um, fabrics donated from various suppliers across London who were really thrilled to support this project. We recruited nine woodworking mentors and nine clients from the shelter, and we partnered them up to co-design and build pieces of furniture to suit their individual needs as they moved into their own spaces, exploring how to design functional, multi-purpose and portable pieces out of reclaimed materials from the museum, which obviously have their own uh, design restrictions. And here you can see some of our me mentors and clients working together on the pieces, uh, with the designs being fully led by the client and as far as possible, enabling them to build it themselves. 
um, there was a request from the charity initially to make small modular uh, pieces because they wanted it to be convenient, but actually what was wanted was a, a throne, a bed, a writing desk. Um, so it was a really beautiful process to deliver exactly what the clients wanted. And then on the day, we exhibited all the pieces here in the tunnel um, leading from South Kensington Station to the museum. And there are a couple of quotes here from the mentors and the participants for whom this was a really beneficial experience. It led many of them to move into a much better space with their mental health, uh, have more drive and interest to continue to keep making. And for the young designers involved, as you can see, everyone found it a really valuable experience and wanted to put their skills to a socially beneficial cause. We do have a little film about this. There isn't time to show today, but if anyone's interested, I can pass this to Graciela to send on. Uh, I'll just quickly show you the other aspect of the um, exhibition as well, of the project, um, which was to deliver a food waste feast on uh, furniture also made from the reclaimed crates. We did an open call across London for designers to come into the workshop, use the same crates and build a range of modular dining furniture that would be used to host this food waste feast on the same day uh, in the tunnel. And then we would then partner with our um, people's, uh, sorry, donate to our uh, food waste partner, People's Kitchen, uh, the furniture for use in their, in their new community kitchen, which needed furniture. And we had an overwhelming response from uh, the community to be part of this project. And uh, designers and makers and students came in and built a range of tables and benches that you can see here for the event that were encouraged to be modular, transportable um, and multifunctional to aid their use in a community design setting. Um, so yeah, it was a hugely ambitious project in many ways and very challenging, um, but also very successful in terms of, of what it gave to those involved. The designers for the open call and the mentors and the clients from 999 Club all reported that it was a very life affirming experience to work together in this way towards a common goal particularly using you know, materials that normally would have been disposed of. We had some really lovely pickups in the press at the time, the big issue particularly of being a great acknowledgement of this collaboration. And for me personally, it was really important for this to not to be a one-off event, um, but to act as a pilot project that showcased what we could do um, by not only offering our surplus materials to those who, who, could, who could use them, but pr providing a creative platform to su support a diverse community of designers and makers and for demonstrating design solutions to the environmental and social issues that we face as a society. Uh, so the intention was to try and have uh, a legacy beyond this one-off event. Um, obviously COVID hit not long after, my secondment came to an end, so the momentum um, unfortunately uh, dropped for a while, um, but very thankfully one of the makers involved in the project got in contact with me last year and has helped to broker a new relationship with a social enterprise called Participatory City, who already have an amazing infrastructure, they're based in Barking, and we've been starting to partner up with them to continue to pick up these threads of what we worked on with the pilot project. Um, they, uh, they focus on building co-creative spaces for communities to be able to work, play and create together. They offer practical training, resources and support new pathways to work and self-employment. Um, so again, with the support of the festivals team at the BNA, we're trying to support this relationship going forward. Um, in Christmas last year, we again donated um, some uh, old benches from our reading room. Sorry, not sorry, old they were old drawers from um, reading room uh, furniture that were made um, created by the community into these benches um, and hooks uh, that were displayed at the Great Exhibition Road Festival last year and are now on sale in their pop-up shop. So looking to the future, we want to continue our attention on the issue of plastic waste um, with Participatory City taking some of our acrylic uh, to work with their precious plastics machines there. And we're also discussing opportunities for further collaborations within our festivals program where we can support them in their ambitions to share skills through participatory workshops uh, and showcase designs and creations from their community of uh, emerging artists. We're really also keen to revive our partnership with 999 Club and we're exploring ideas for this year, which marks both the year of Lewisham, where they're based as the Borough of Culture and the 30th anniversary of the charity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zoe. Really such an interesting project. You know, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime I got an opportunity, I mention it. <laughs> and, um, and there is quite a few comments, but we, we are going to, yes, it's fantastic, says here Hillary. But um, now we have Alison Credo. Alison is the Museum Carbon Literacy Officer as part of Roots and Brands 
and cheese. That's another fantastic project as well, which is a partnership project between Museum Development Northwest, the Carbon Literacy Project, and Manchester Museum. Delivering the branches, she enables the scale up and roll out of carbon literacy across museums in England. Alison is also a facilitator and a consultant working with organizations, networks, and partnerships across arts and culture to innate climate and environmental responsibility. Over to you, Alison, now. Are you Thank here? You. You're welcome. Thank you. I will share my slides in just a moment. So I'm Alison, my pronouns are she, her. Hopefully you can hear me okay. And for the purposes of audio description, I am a white woman um, with blondish curly hair and a bright green top. Um, so I will dive into sharing my slides. Now, hopefully you can see. Yes, we can, we can see them, all good. Thank you. Um, so as Graciela said, um, I'm going to be talking to you this afternoon about roots and branches um, and specifically uh, the branches of, of the roots. So um, Roots and Branches is a collaborative project. So three different partners, the Carbon Literacy Project, who are based up in Manchester, Manchester Museum um, and Museum Development England, led by Museum Development Northwest. So there are nine different regions um, of museum development across England. Um, so the project launched in uh, November last year um, and it aims to empower museums to undertake organisation wide uh, environmental action and it is uh, funded by Arts Council England National Lottery Heritage, uh, National Lottery Project Grant um, and uh, it's well underway now so I'll explain a little bit more about it. So the image that you're seeing on screen is a lantern slide image of a tree in a, a park um, in a Manchester suburb and its roots are exposed as well so that's our, our image for our project. So the roots side of the project is to create a nationally significant co-working hub um, of cultural environmental action at Manchester Museum. Uh, what does that mean? That has a few different aspects to it so that's having a brand new role so a new environmental action manager um, in post and that's a shared post between Manchester Museum and the Carbon Literacy Project Project and Hannah Hartley is, is, is in post now delivering on that role. Um, and uh, so she is um, responsible for essentially helping us to join the dots between um, strategy and action and bringing together all the different strands of activity, ideas and planning across the museum and the wider community. So creating the, the museum as a space for, for climate action, um, bringing together museum educators, researchers, environmentalists, artists, um, third sector organisations, and of course students as well. So Manchester Museum is part of the University of Manchester. So when um, the museum reopens uh, next February, um, we'll be seeing uh, the top floor of the museum being a flexible space. So we'll have things like artist studios, a teaching studio, there'll be a greenhouse up there, um, there's a therapy room, there'll be space for pop-up exhibitions and events, um, as well as co-working um, spaces and meeting areas as well. So really exciting to see that continued progress. And the branches side of things is creating a carbon literate, environmentally aware and active museum sector. Um, so a little bit more about that. So that's where my role comes in. So um, that is involving developing a museum sector specific carbon literacy toolkit. So that's building on the, the knowledge and the learning of Museum Development Northwest over the course of the last Oh, I'd say coming close to 10 years now um, um, of, of doing green museums, um, schemes and programs, developing a carbon literacy course and then turning that and translating that into a toolkit, which can be a replicable um, pick up a uh, tool that, that other museums um, and people across across the sector can access. So the idea of that is to help to build capacity, skills and knowledge and essentially share a lot of those skills and knowledge as well across the sector to help to take those steps to reduce carbon and also to drive climate action and responsibility. 
that's taking place across the the nine regional museum development teams so i've just come straight from a course that was running in the southeast um online um so taking place all across them over the course of the the next uh remaining eight, nine months of the project, um, we'll be delivering courses um, in our regions and across our regions as well, collaborating together. Um, my role within that as Carbon Literacy Officer is to be sort of the, the, the glue that holds everything together and helps to keep furthering it forward. Um, and also being able to support um, people to become trainers, to access the toolkit and to pick it up and have the confidence and the skills to be able to deliver it um, in their own organizations and in their wider networks. And as part of the project as well, we want to continue to understand and build learning across the sector and across our museums. Um, so that's capturing insight into what we're seeing that our museums are needing additional support on or what what do they need to take the next steps to to take that action and we're in the process of having some deep dive discovery into identifying some of those themes and maybe what some of those resources or support could look like moving forwards so the toolkit itself um, was designed to be a catalyst for organisations who are already places of education and engagement to deliver these vital societal messages in addressing climate change. And that starts within the spaces of our museums and our institutions. So carbon literacy um, is a uh, an awareness of the skills and knowledge to take action and communicate the need for climate action um, across our communities and our workplaces and our on our organizations. So it entails a day's worth of learning um, where you essentially um, gain some uh, climate awareness, some knowledge, um, basic climate science, but really for us with the toolkit for museums, it's about having that dialogue and that opportunity to communicate with one another, to build skills and to build ideas ideas together to, to take that action forwards. Um, so this is because we know that we're facing the climate crisis. It's driven by those greenhouse gas emissions and that museums themselves have a significant footprint, but we also have a really significant platform in which we can um, encourage and drive and, and engage in that need for action. So this, this resource is, you know, the design is for that anybody within the, the sector should be able to pick it up. So um, it is um, inclusive. It is, we encourage it to be open to all members of museum teams um, from volunteers right through to every different strand um, and, and strain of, of, of the work of a museum and its wider networks as well from governance and trustees and, and beyond. Um, so we want to be sort of stewarding the knowledge that we have now so that we're using it both now and for the future as well, and also taking into account the responsibilities that we might have within our own museums and addressing our historical impacts and, and the role that we can play within our communities too. Um, and it speaks to the values that we have um, within our institutions and our, on our um, collections care and also care for our planet as well. Oh, so I'll just say that the toolkit itself launched um, in January last year. We piloted it during uh, COP26 um, in November last year uh, online, um, and we launched it in, in uh, January this year. So it's almost been running for six months now. And the beauty of it is that we want it to continue to be live. So we're constantly learning about the work that we're doing and the responses that we're getting and, and making those updates as we go along, as we get new information, as language is continually in flux and as our, our knowledge continues to develop. So the course outline itself is broken down into four modules. So there's a, an introductory element, there's a documentary, there's a, an object activity where we ask um, uh, delegates to uh, identify objects that speak to them about climate. So we begin to have those conversations. Um, and we, we touch on the basics of climate change science and greenhouse gas emissions um, and, and think about some of those impacts locally and globally as well. We then consider equity and vulnerability. And at the moment we're in a process process of redeveloping and, and continuing to evolve those conversations as well. So we're very much linking up our alignment with the work um, that's been um, published so recently with Julie's Bicycle and Climate Justice um, and really building that into the, the, the toolkit considering the role of museums and what we can do and the roles that we can play and some of the co-benefits to taking climate action. So what are the benefits does that have for our museums, for our institutions and for our organisations? 
We explore some policy at global, national, local sector levels. Um, and then we do a little bit of exploration around carbon footprints. And again, building in the knowledge that we have across the sector, including the work of Creative Green and being able to have share that, that sector information. So we know from, from data of previous years that, that those museums that have been reporting in England contribute to almost 25% or a quarter of, of emissions across the cultural sector. And we start to unpack that a little bit and start to understand just how complex a beast doing that carbon calculating is. And we looked at some case studies. So um, just seeing the names of some of the people on the chat today, and um, there's definitely some of you who are part of our case studies as well, whose stories that we're telling and sharing with others um, so that we can have some peer-to-peer -peer learning as well. Um, and finally, um, module four is all about action. So thinking who we can influence, what our ripple effects can be, and really exploring action. So part of carbon literacy is to um, uh, in order to become certified, it's to generate actions, part of individual and part of a group um, that you can commit to in order to take them forward to help to reduce emissions and to have both direct and indirect um, influences to take climate action. And also to be able to communicate and have those conversations and to continue those dialogues. So the learning objectives are to gain an understanding of the basics of climate change, um, climate change and the science to learning how, um, to exploring how climate change is and can continue and will continue to affect museums, um, to explore the impacts that we can have on taking climate change, to create actions, to reduce those footprints and to really explore some of those strategies for being able to influence and to continue to learn from one another as well. So every session that I go to or that I co-deliver, I learn so much from, from um, the, the people in the room as well and vice versa. So it's that real dialogue of sharing. Um, and a little bit of trainer insight, this is from um, uh, a regional um, uh, museum development officer who shared this with me just recently, who delivered their first cohort of training. Um, and this was the feedback that they gave us. So they had done the training themselves. They'd, they'd been supported to be able to pick up and access the toolkit and roll it out in their region. And they say that the ripple effect from the training is going to be massive. So delegates are planning to host monthly lunches across the museum, start a green team network for all working at a uh, all working at a group of linked museums and include green objectives and all the policies and actions for new museum charity being formed. Exciting stuff. So we could blow our own trumpets here, but actually what you can see on screen is this is actions and initiatives. You know, this isn't just the toolkit. This is the work of the people who are in the room who are committing to wanting to make those changes and to evolve those networks and take action. Um, and some of the, the um, learners have been sharing different ways that they've identified of ways to be able to get to net zero. I'll just pick a couple of them out on screen so I know we're tight for time. So saying that we need to actively challenge our employers to set and achieve climate control related targets in our workspaces and work alongside them. And that's crucially to be able to achieve it together. So it's that collective responsibility as well as individual action. And that museums have a, place, a role to play here as spaces where these discussions can happen. So our role in the space that we occupy as institutes of public education, but also the power that we have as well, and the trust that's held within us um, and within our sector too. So making those changes and somebody who wants to talk to policymakers, visitors um, and board members, we can do this. And I had a, a delegate last week who's already contacted me said that they're going to put uh, two of their trustees through a, a, a session as well, um, who are going to be completing the training. So thinking about where they can take um, their knowledge and how they can share it outwards. And again, if we're thinking about governance and influence, um, uh, how we can use our knowledge and our advocacy. So opening up these conversations, it really also speaks to the work that's happening across um, museums in addressing equity and also our, our, our histories as well um, and our collections and where we want to be moving forwards and what, you know, what is our current story that we're telling of our immediate um, moment and where's that going to be moving forwards. So how we can think about drawing up a reasonable governance policy to shape the carbon impact of the museum moving forwards and setting clear goals for achieving carbon neutrality this is a very you know this is this is a lot going on in this paragraph of, of, of what's being shared with us but that's really setting the agenda for moving forwards um, and the beauty of, of, of these shared sessions that we're running in these mixed cohorts is, is that cross-pollination and sharing 
sharing um, across museums and sharing and developing new networks and, and building on the relationships that are there already. So that is me. Um, I'll um, share um, in the chat the link to the find out more about the museum's toolkit as well. But at this point, I will stop sharing my screen um, and hand back to Graciela. Thank you, Alison. It's really another fantastic project that is growing. And I believe that also we want to spread the word about this project. Yeah, so I want, I want to invite everybody now to share some questions uh, through the chat, and then we can have a, a, a bit more of a conversation. Uh, in, the, in the meantime, um, I just wanted to get a little bit, pick your brains, both of you, Alison and Zoe, in terms of what do you think that the museum sector needs to do to, to spread all these sustainability practice and link to wider issues uh, that the sector is, tackle, uh, is at the moment looking into it? It's a big question. <laughs> it's a big um, question. <laughs> I think these networks are doing wonderful things, though, because so much um, progress has been made. And if you look at the, the, oh, the example of the design museum, for example, that you that you shared, that was really groundbreaking and really helpful learning. Um, and a lot of these things I found from the networks I've been involved in more before the pandemic, because um, things have to kind of come back now, the communities of, of sharing, but things are happening in silos and some wonderful ideas are taking place and some things that could really set a new blueprint for other museums to use are, are, are there, um, but we're not always aware of, of what's going on. So I think, yeah, more opportunities to get together like this and share best practice and take those ideas back to your organisation and try and implement them um, are really, really beneficial. Yeah, thank you, Zoe. It's definitely something that we've been um, every cohort that we deliver. There's, there's there's similar questions like where do we find the information? How do we learn from each other? How do we develop these these networks further? And and hopefully we can do lots of signposting to encourage people to to contact each other. But yeah, continuum with the learning I think is is a really big part of it. And and doing that joined up thinking between the different the different strands and activities that are taking place. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, good. Yeah, we in, in Julie's Bicycle, I also want to invite everybody to share their best practice and their actions. And we are always looking for case studies. So we bring all this in our research papers and also in case studies that we share through through the web. So um, so always uh, happy to share more. Um, and so you are involved with two community focused museums as well, or you have been involved. Um, how do you bring communities and grassroots partnerships into the museum space? Do you have any uh, sort of a special approach to do, do this? And what impact do you think it, does it have on the wider social fabric of, of the area? I'm, I'm quite interested on, on bringing community um, issues into the museum no, as a collective space because museums are collective public spaces. Absolutely. Well, it's something I'm very invested in from, from my kind of uh, background coming from community heritage. It's interesting then working in a, in a large national organization where, um, especially in, in the exhibitions department in which I work, work, that's not necessarily the remit of that department. So what I found that I've, that's been helpful in making these projects happen is to actually seek support from other parts of the organization where that is more of a priority. So working with your learning teams, which will normally have a lot of connections already in schools and in communities. And our festivals team have been really, <clears throat> um, they've, they've been the reason that these projects have happened because again, they're there to be more responsive, more reflective. Uh, they're there to respond to current issues. Um, again, in a large organization like this, where it, it's again in the remit of my department, um, it's more long term planning and less ability to just kind of come up with an idea and, and do something that's very kind of scratch or very responsive. Um, I've sought support from the departments who have the budget and resource to do that. Um, so that's really what made these projects be able to, to, to happen and also just um, working with personal contacts and networks. So I think with the sustainability agenda at the moment, it's uh, kind of 
the path of least resistance you know if you have if you know someone or someone knows something and or finding just a kindred spirit in your organization uh if it's not yet a really um a formal part or a formal priority of your department or your organization it's finding people who for whom it is a priority and, and coming together and putting your energies together to make it happen um because these early initiatives were kind of done on a bit of a wing and a prayer they were based on knowing somebody or uh, someone's contact um and a lot of good grace and good will on behalf of all the people who were involved um and that links, in, links into one of the challenges as well, which might be another question about, you know, what what are the challenges? And sometimes it it's it, it's that that you can make something happen through a lot of goodwill, but how to make that model sustainable? Um, and that's where you need more support from the the, the top the top down. Um, and yeah, it was important for us for this project to really benefit the local community. Um, we tried very hard to make that central to. Um, to the furniture project. Obviously, the, the partner that we that, 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 that inspired the project happened to be in Deptford or Lewisham. It wasn't the same borough. Um, but we tried to invite as the speakers who were on the tables, uh, local community groups um, uh, to, to be part of that, because I think it's it's essential, especially in uh, Kensington, where uh, you know it's a, it's a mixed demographic in this borough, but it's not always equally represented in a space like this. Um, so yeah, it's something that I would love to be able to do more of in my role. Um, but as I said, the main thing for me is looking for allies within the organization for whom it's a priority and trying to get support from them. Yeah, thank you, Zoe. <laughs> thank you. Um, and I wanted to ask Alison, uh, what is next for Roots and Branches? We, if if we want to ambition the future, yeah, I think so. What's next in the immediate future is that all of the courses have been designed for. Well, the, the course has been designed for online delivery. So next week we will be piloting what that looks like in a face to face environment, and then continuing to do a a little update. So we'll be having an update of the course content and some of the materials um, later in the summer to early autumn, um, dates TBC, um, but we'll also be doing a sharing event around that as well to, to support people. We continue to run bi-monthly trainer support sessions for those who are looking to access the toolkit um, and supporting them through you know, the steps that it takes to be able to pick this up, what's required to be able to access it. And, and as I said, we want to keep this live. So you know, this is a project specific, you know, it's got it's it's got it's got a time frame around it. It's you know it's got a specific budget attached to it but we are hoping to continue to build on our learning to to be able to um, support where this wants to go moving forward how we can continue to use it across our museum development teams so you don't get that knowledge drain um, as obviously as, as organizations continue to develop and uh, you know people um, move and evolve to new roles um, how do we keep this going and how do we continue to build on it because ideally we're going to have a very carbon literate engaged museum workforce um, and, and sector. So once we have that knowledge, what are we gonna do with it? So again, that's really interesting to see what's coming back through the actions. There's gonna be a lot of, for some organizations, low hanging fruit that has been achieved or can be achieved. Um, and then it's been able to say, okay, well, we have this knowledge, we know what's required what can we do next? And again, I think it's gonna be a lot of that collective action, having that continued dialogue um, with, with different, um, whether it's funders, whether it's policymakers, whether it's that's national, whether that's hyper-local, again, identifying what that role is um, and really continuing to, to, to develop the toolkit in line with that and to have that resource there for people too. So yeah, it's very much, um, continues to be and should continue to be a work in progress in the sense that this work is never going to be done. It's always going to be um, moving. Yeah, it's always changing and it's the journey really, it's not the destination, it's really this journey that, that we are working towards, no? I'm gonna have a quick look, there is a couple of comments in the chat. Um, so we got a comment from Harshet, I hope I pronounce it right. Recycling is great, but what practical suggestions, resources to make the change when producing exhibitions uh, is, is one. 
and uh, from Hillary, there used to be a museum free cycle type of a scheme. Does anyone know what happened to it? There is a set exchange website for theater TV um, as well. Let me. I can answer to the Museo Cycle. So Museo Cycle um, definitely still exists as far as I'm aware. It used to be quite London centric. Um, we, at the launch of COP26 uh, in the Northwest, we've piloted bringing it back across the North and the Northwest. So we have a Northwest Museo Cycle at the moment that we're trying out to see what the response has been. And so far the response is high. So we had um, a museum in Cheshire come to the Manchester Museum, a uh, of weeks ago when they've identified some materials um, that they're going to have um, and, and, and share back with their their museums as well so there has been some really interesting things that we've seen from cabinets to uh, collections and, and some great examples of how they're being repurposed within materials um, within within museums as well so um, just responding to Hajit's as well so yeah resources to make the change when producing exhibitions um, is uh, all I can suggest and Zoe might say the same as well as planning from the word go so embedding those principles from the start um, if it's only other thoughts about at the end it's only only ever going to be an add-on rather than something that is part and parcel of the plan and that might affect budgets it might affect resource time um, it might require a bit of research or a bit of thinking about things or, or finding different materials to make it happen um, but again it's that that sort of circular economy approach within within the museum itself um, but yeah, planning and also working with, if, you, if you're having freelancers who are contracted to do it, making sure that they're on board with what you're asking them to do and supporting them with that as well, because um, that's part of the, the conversation too. Yeah, thank you, Alison. Yes, in our experience, I would encourage you to have a look at the approach we had with the Barbican for uh, the, our Time to Earth exhibition, where we look at looking at all these issues very, very early on. So this was included in the brief, it's included in the contract for the designers of the furniture, for the printers. Uh, it's looking at every single step in terms of well, what can we do differently uh, and can, how can we look at our environmental impacts in, in a different way. So I think what Alison was saying is crucial really, is timing, looking uh, really from from the start. I'll have a look if there is any other questions. Uh, so there is a comment about um, the Circular Arts Network, which seems to be in Scotland also, which there is yeah, just uh, sharing. And um, yes, it would be great to have also some infrastructure for all this. This is something that we are discussing uh, not only with museums and galleries, but also with the theaters about the importance of having some infrastructure for reusing uh, uh, furniture and materials and, and support uh, that element that, that goes beyond the individual museum, really. So it's something to work in, in cities or in towns uh, in terms of uh, providing good infrastructure in the circular economy for the cultural sector. It may not be just for the museums, it can be done at, uh, as a whole sector no? as well. So, um, so we go a couple of minutes more before we finish. If you wanna share any questions on, or any thoughts, please, please do. I, I had a last question for Alison and Zoe. Um, and I was thinking about um, talking about a bit about barriers and challenges doing this work. The spin is been all around, but maybe there is something else that you want to say. Um, so, help, so what, what obstacles have you faced when 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 you started doing this work? Um, yes, I have touched on, on some of them before. I suppose uh, sim because the, v the nature of the V&A being a sort of world leading museum of art and design, what this kind of interesting moment we're at now is about the degree to which we're willing to scale back on the, the, the production level of things and, and the, the finish and the quality and the newness of everything. Um, 
because for, for each of our exhibitions, there is an expectation. We work with a different design team, a different contractor, a different curator. And so everything is expected to be completely designed, you know, afresh with new materials. Um, so that's an interesting moment that we're at. Um, depending on individuals and their commitment to kind of uh, compromising on, on maybe the finish of a material as opposed to um, how environmentally friendly it will be. So that's been something interesting. And again, coming from community heritage background where it's a very different approach, um, I'm finding that balance very interesting. But I do feel there has been a momentum, momentum shift um, and for the most part, everyone is really committed to making these changes. And so it's just part of the creative process now of, of looking for more environmentally friendly ways of delivering the same level of impact. Um, and I'm also finding it quite interesting kind of level of transparency now with the public, because I think the public are actually getting much more invested um, in how their cultural experiences are created and the degree to which you know, they might be environmentally harmful. Um, so a challenge used to be on, um, quite difficult to kind of share where you are with a journey or a museum, again, a large organization being reluctant to, let's say, declare climate emergency or be transparent about challenges. Um, but I feel like we're shifting a little bit now in terms of a shared um, willingness to be a bit more vulnerable and a bit more transparent about the challenges, which is coming from forums such as this where that's being encouraged and you can see that other museums are also struggling with the same things so again everyone could be a bit more honest about it and, and experiment um, so I'm finding that that challenge is is, is getting easier um, but yeah as I said before it's really just to think about finding allies within your organization and allies within your networks where you can kind of join forces and have a bit more of a, a voice together uh, to try and kind of overcome where there might have been barriers to making changes before. Yeah, thank you. So yes, I think it's a, actually, I don't want to finish with the challenges and barriers because it's, if it's yeah, the opposite, but I think it's about recognizing and, and working together no, through all of them. And I don't know, Alison, if you want to add any last thoughts we, we are getting now towards the end. I was just thinking of what Zoe had said and some of those challenges and, and actually there's a lot of shared knowledge and lots of things happening separately but we're definitely seeing in some of our uh, museums in in England and the UK who are local authority parts of local authorities or city councils the fact that they have strategies or they have declared climate emergency or they have that these ambitions it's being able to learn from what museums are doing and actually remembering what the potential that we have is that as a sector we are used to doing a lot very creatively often with very little um, and that we're also not afraid to share those things and it's the flip of I think other, some other sectors might still be in a stage of thinking that their sustainability has to be their USP whereas for us sustainability is us keeping going continuing to be museums to continue to share those collections and continuing to um, welcome more and more people into our spaces and have deeper conversations and there's actually a lot of power that we have in that that we can share with other people so whilst we're having restrictions and funding and cuts and you know particularly what's happening around us in the cost of living crisis and wider global crisis is not to be overlooked but how do we think about using our own power to be able to share that with others um, as well yeah Thank you, Alison. And, and about deeper conversations, that's an area that we are developing. And I want to encourage everybody to have a look at our environmental justice um, hub, because there is quite a lot of um, different areas um, to work in terms, of, no, in terms of social and environmental justice as well. Um, and we are getting to the end. Uh, really, I want to say thank you so much, Alison. Thank you so much, Zoe, really, for all your experience, for sharing the learning. Um, we want to keep on doing this, finding the, the tools and the networks to keep on doing this, really, to, sh to share. Uh, I want to say thank you to Kathy from Julie's Bicycles as well, that she's there, really answering um, some of the comments in the chat. And I should have mentioned that Toby is on the tech today. Thank you, Toby, also for supporting all this work. Thank you, Ruby. And Farah is not here, but she's been working hard also to make, to make this webinar happen. 
Um, so uh, the recording of this event will be available on your website, on our website shortly. We will send a follow-up email for you as well. There is a short feedback survey link in the chat. Um, also, if you can spare a moment, please do fill out and help us to keep on improving on our events offering. And thank you very much to all of you really for being here today. Uh, keep an eye, of course, on new resources and events by following us on social media and at Julie's Bicycle. And there is now um, the survey on the web link. And so we keep, we leave it there for a minute if you want to copy. And we are going to finish in, in a couple of minutes uh, now. Um, yeah, that's it really from me. And have a wonderful evening. And keep in touch, all of you, really. Yeah.